the Ottoman Janissaries were arguably the most feared soldiers of the 15th and 16th centuries. The Sultan's elite warriors were notorious for their military clout, mercilessness and skill with the musket. They were forcibly recruited as boys from among the sons of Christian families and then trained for years to become Muslim fighters, living exclusively for war. The Janissaries were the Sultan's bodyguard, his loyal instruments of power and the core of his army. They were the centerpiece of the standard Ottoman order of battle called Tabur Jengi and among the earliest adopters of volley fire tactics. No other unit was as important for the expansion of the Ottoman Empire. In this video we explore how the Janissaries became the Sultan's elite, why they were recruited from enslaved Christians, how they fought and why they were different from Western pike and shot armies. In the remote wooded valleys of the Ottoman-controlled Balkans, Christian parents trembled when the Ottoman recruiters arrived. They knew the Ottomans had come to take their sons. From the reign of Murat II, most of the Janissaries recruits came from the so-called child levy or Devshirme. This was a form of forced recruitment in which Christian youths were systematically conscripted every one to five years, educated as Muslims and trained as soldiers. It is impossible to say how many youths were involved, but historians estimate that 1,000 to 12,000 boys were conscripted each year. Only families with a single son and Jewish families were spared. The recruits were usually between 8 and 20 years old and unattached, so they were still physically and ideologically malleable. In some areas of the Balkans, for example in Bulgaria, the infamous child levy is still a symbol of the so-called Turkish yoke the oppression of the local population by the Ottomans. But it was also the basis for the success of the Janissaries. However, the child levy was not part of the Ottomans' recruitment methods from day one. Let's jump back and see how the Janissaries emerged. As the Ottomans increased the size of their territory from a small principality in the mountainous northwest of Asia Minor into an empire in the 15th century, the need for a more professional army quickly arose. The Sultans Orhan and Murat I reformed their troops and replaced the traditional tribal warriors with a centrally controlled army that was sworn to support the Sultan and consisted of provincial troops which were raised by the provincial governors in times of war and a central standing army known as the Slaves of the Port. The Port or High Port is a reference to the central government of the Ottoman state. These enslaved troops were in essence the Sultan's household divisions, with the Janissaries forming their backbone. Creating YouTube videos can be a daunting prospect, especially if you're like us and have to learn it all by yourself. Here's where InVideo AI, the sponsor of today's video, comes in. InVideo is an AI-powered program that can turn any idea into a video with just a few text prompts. Let me run you through the process. Type your video idea into the prompt box, click Generate and that's it. It's usually best if you add as many details as possible to the prompt to create the best results. Now InVideo's AI processes the details and quickly creates videos in just a few minutes. The videos can have voiceovers if you wish. In the hushed whispers of history, tales of empires, kings and battles echo through time. You can even add your own voice and then easily use it with simple text prompts. This means you can create videos without having to edit or record anything. Once generated, you have the option to edit the videos very easily by clicking the edit command box below the video. Just type in the changes you want. You can change the lighting or switch the voiceover from male to female. In the hushed whispers of history, tales of empires, kings and battles echo through time. But it's best to try it out yourself, so check out our link in the description below and start using InVideo AI today to create up to 4 watermark videos for free or upgrade to a paid plan which starts as low as $20 a month. To remove the watermark and gain access to millions of royalty-free stock footage clips and human-sounding voices. The term Janissary, in Turkish Yeniceri, means new soldier. When and by whom they were created and the nature of their original task are still subject to debate. The German historian Bodo Hechelhammer assumes that they initially served as a bodyguard, which gradually was expanded and took on more functions. In these early days, the Janissaries were forcibly recruited from non-Muslim prisoners of war, taken by the Empire in its numerous wars of conquest. 
But when the Ottoman Empire and its army grew, it became apparent that this system could hardly support more than the approximately 2,000 men who served as Janissaries under Murat I. For this reason, the child levy was introduced. It allowed the corps to grow to around 6,000 men by 1475. But how exactly did Christian boys become elite Muslim soldiers? Once the officers of the Janissaries had selected suitable boys, they took them to Constantinople. There, historian Virginio Ascon explains, the best 5-7% to were chosen for palace service and sent to the palace schools in Bursa, Edirne, Constantinople and Galata. Education at these elite schools enabled them to rise to the highest ranks of the empire. Probably the most famous example of a boy who achieved such a success was Sokolu Mehmed Pasha, who won the trust of Suleiman the Magnificent and became Grand Vizier of the Ottoman Empire in 1565. All other recruits were sent to respectable Anatolian farmer families, who systematically re-educated them and taught them the Ottoman values and the rules of Islam. Hard physical labor prepared them for their future careers. When they returned to Constantinople after five to seven years, they were assigned to compulsory labor. For example, they might work on the transport ships crossing the Bosporus, on the Sultan's construction projects, or in the palace gardens. Interestingly, it seems some of them never entered the corps, but remained recruits and even became experts in something else, for example a trade serving the Sultan in that capacity. For the remaining recruits, military training began after this period of indoctrination and hard labor. The boys were assigned to special training units, the Ajemi Ochan. There, groups of around 10 to 15 recruits were each trained by a veteran. The recruits lived in seclusion and celibacy, and the focus was on discipline and obedience. They were supposed to internalize loyalty to the Sultan and their comrades above all else. The practical training was focused on fighting information and weapon use. Every move had to be practiced. The recruits spent days shooting at clay pots and hitting felt hats to perfect their movements. The endless drill was particularly important for learning to handle the firearms that were their hallmark. Western observers frequently spoke with fear about the precision and speed of the Ottoman marksmen. At the end of the training, there was a final examination. Those who passed received the characteristic Janissary uniform and were accepted as full core members. As the empire expanded, so did the corps. From 2,000 men under Murat I, the troop grew to 53,000 men by 1708. The empire needed more and more soldiers to control its growing territories and fight its numerous wars, such as the conflict with the Habsburgs in the 16th century. As the size of the corps increased, the influence of the Janissaries grew. By the 1440s at the latest, they were aware of their importance and began to make use of their influence in the Sultan's palace. For example, when Sultan Murat II abdicated in 1444 and gave the throne to young Mehmed II, they opposed the change of ruler, and Murad had to return in 1446 to rule for another five years. The Janissary Corps was a closed-off, elite, disciplined brotherhood in arms. The strict training and indoctrination caused its members to see themselves as living exclusively for war. The Janissaries lived in secluded barracks, mostly in Constantinople, and were prohibited from marrying or conducting business. Absolute obedience was paramount, and they followed a strict code of conduct. Alcohol, gambling and brawling were forbidden, and order and cleanliness were priorities. Desertion and cowardice were punishable by death. The strict, isolated life strengthened the esprit de corps of the Janissaries, which in turn gave them the indestructible fighting morale for which they are known, and which earned them a reputation in the West as merciless, fanatical warriors. That reputation has persisted to this day among the public and Western researchers. Although it was probably more due to the contemporaries' fear of them than real fanaticism. What is true, however, is that the Janissaries had strict religious views. They followed the teachings of a very influential order in the Balkans and Anatolia, the Bektashi. The Bektashi also provided their field chaplains and the model for the strict organization and inspired the costumes of the Janissaries. The famous white felt cap, called Burk or Kece, symbolizes the sleeve of Hajj Bektash, for example. The Janissaries were military slaves who belonged to the Sultan, but had numerous privileges. They were provided with food, exempted from taxes and received regular pay. 
Also, they weren't liable to normal persecution, only their superiors were allowed to punish them. Their commanders were very influential and received his orders exclusively from the Sultan, who, interestingly, was always a member of the Janissaries, at least formally. The commander, the Aga of the Janissaries, oversaw three regiments of the corps. The regiment of the Aga, which provided the Sultan's bodyguard, the assembly, which provided the frontier troops, the regiment of the dog guards, and finally, the training unit. The regiments were divided into 196 companies, known as Ortos, which were tactically independent. They usually consisted of 50 to 100 men each and formed the community the Janissaries lived in, as the men of an Orta shared a barrack and fought together. The Janissaries referred to their society as Hearth, Ojak in Turkish, which reflected both the core's tribal tradition and self-perception as a family group. The term also inspired the rank names, which were based on positions on the kitchen staff or on the Sultan's royal hunters. For instance, the captain of a company was called Chorbazi, which means soup master. Fittingly, the most important symbol of the Janissaries was their cooking pot, the Kazan. Its function was similar to that of a standard in a Western army. The Kazan was a rallying point. It was where the Janissaries swore allegiance to the Sultan and where their uprisings began. Tipping the pot over was a sign of mutiny, and losing the cauldron was an incredible disgrace for the entire regiment. The Janissaries had a wide range of tasks. They protected the Sultan, garrisoned border fortresses, fought on ships, and even took on police and firefighting functions in Constantinople. Their core task, however, was always war. Janissaries were widely renowned for their use of the musket. In the early days, they had been expert infantry archers, and they had long clung to the traditional bow. Still, when the effectiveness of firearms became apparent during the wars of the 1440s, more and more Janissaries began to use muskets. One of the first times that the use of a small number of firearms was reported was at the Battle of Varna in 1444, in which a European coalition attempted to stop the Ottoman expansion into the Balkans, but failed. The Sultan encouraged the use of firearms, and under Suleiman the Magnificent, at least half of the Janissaries were equipped with them. According to Jill Weinstein, an expert on the history of the Ottoman Empire, this was a decisive factor in their emergence as the empire's elite. The Sultans tried to restrict muskets to the loyal Janissaries to maintain control over the powerful weapon. Although this worked only briefly, muskets became the signature weapon of the Janissaries. But while they were primarily remembered as marksmen, the Janissaries were also skilled melee fighters. Their arsenal was extensive, with weapons ranging from axes and swords to the famous Yatan, a short saber. Two weapons they used only rarely, however, were pikes and bayonets. This is because the Janissaries were skeptical of fighting in closed formation, as Western pike and shot armies did, and instead preferred to rely on field fortifications, firepower and individual skill in battle. As the elite of the Ottoman army, they were involved in the empire's major campaigns. Their earliest documented engagements included the conquest of Edirne in 1361 and Konya in 1389. Their most famous, the conquest of Constantinople in 1453 and the sieges of Vienna in 1529 and 1683. In fact, siege warfare was the Janissary's specialty. Their corps included specialists such as marksmen, sappers and explosive experts who skillfully prepared the attacks, while contingents of around 100 volunteers, known as Sardan Yechte, rushed forward to break the enemy lines and gain a foothold in its defenses. The Sardan Yechte were a kind of death squadron, heavily armed and rewarded with higher pay. Once the defenders were weakened or the walls breached, the Janissaries launched forward a mass charge to decide the battle. The tactics and fighting methods of the Janissaries have not yet been thoroughly researched. This is due, at least in part, to the fact that the Janissaries kept their tactics a secret and rarely wrote them down. However, they adapted inevitably to the developments in warfare and even adopted the latest methods. One example is volley fire. For a long time, scholars thought that the Ottomans adopted this mode of fire much later than Western armies. However, historians such as Gabor Agoston have convincingly argued that the Janissaries probably used some sort of volley fire as early as the Battle of Mohac in 1526. Near Mohac, the attacking Hungarian army was stopped by the Janissaries' musketry and a barrage of Ottoman artillery, and then decisively defeated by an Ottoman counterattack. 
In pitched battles, the Janissaries usually stayed at the Sultan's side and often formed the center of the battle line. This was certainly the case in what historian Brian Davies calls, quote, the standard Ottoman order of battle, the Tabur Jengi. This formation was used regularly by the Ottomans, as early as 1448, in the Second Battle of Kosovo, where they defeated a Hungarian-led army under John Hunyadi. By then, historians Mesut Uyar and Edward Eriksson write, the Ottomans were training gunners to fight in wagon forts, and had even created a special unit, the Hearth of Artillery Wagoners, or Top Arabacilari or Chagi, which was in charge of artillery transport and forming the Tabur Jengi in battle order. Although the Tabur Jengi was probably inspired by Bohemian and Hungarian wagon fort tactics, it relied more heavily on artillery and infantry firepower than, for example, the famous Hussite wagon fort, in which men armed with pole arms and white shields supplied the defense. In contrast, the Ottomans simply stationed Janissaries with heavier muskets behind the wagons and deployed the rest of the Janissaries with lighter firearms in a formation several rows deep behind the guns, wagons and mantelets. In battle, a cavalry screen usually provoked the enemy to attack the center, where the Janissaries and the artillery awaited them in the safety of the wagon fort. When the barrage of artillery and small firearms had weakened the enemy, the Janissaries advanced, firing in volleys by rotating ranks. Finally, they charged forward to crush the enemy in a melee. At the end of the 16th century, the Ottoman Empire suffered increasingly from structural problems. The Sultan's power decreased and their financial difficulties grew. In the long term, this meant that fewer and fewer provincial troops could be raised, and the central army had to be expanded to fill the gap. As a result, it grew from around 20,000 to almost 200,000 soldiers in the first half of the 17th century. Since the child levy no longer provided sufficient recruits, ever more sons of Janissaries and Muslim applicants were accepted. However, these recruits did not have to undergo the Janissaries' traditional re-education and indoctrination, and this failure led to internal disintegration. Discipline and efficiency deteriorated, military successes became rare, and the principles of the Janissaries became diluted. From 1589, Janissaries were allowed to run businesses, marry, and even live outside the barracks if they were married. The new recruitment methods became so prevalent that the child levy and the traditional training were utterly abandoned at the end of the 17th century. Those new Janissaries had little in common with the elite troops of the 16th century. They developed into a social group that owned land, ran businesses, a sort of ruling class. Their influence can be seen in the fact that, from 1645 onwards, the Aga of the Janissaries had the same status as a vizier and therefore also influenced non-military politics. As a result of these changes, uprisings became more frequent. The Janissaries demanded more privileges or better pay and opposed any form of reform. The Janissaries' thirst for power and unwillingness to change ultimately corrupted their loyalty to the Sultan. The decisive moment in this regard was the assassination of Osman II, who recognized the problems of his military system and wanted to reform it after ascending to the throne. When he attempted to limit the power of the Janissaries in 1622, a palace revolt broke out, and the Janissaries strangled him to death. When Mehmed IV ascended the throne in 1648, there were more riots. The Janissaries went even further this time and seized power for three years. Mehmed eventually got the situation under control, but the back and forth between the Sultans and the Janissaries continued. When Selim III tried to reform the army in 1807 and was deposed as well, it was obvious that the Janissaries had become a problem. Therefore, Selim's successor, Mahmoud II, took a more cautious approach. He consolidated his position for about 10 years before announcing his reform plan in 1826. As expected, the Janissaries revolted again and the Sultan took action. In a large-scale military operation, Mahmud had his loyal artillery troops surround the barracks of the Janissaries and shoot all those inside to pieces. About 10,000 were killed on the spot. On June 17, 1826, the Sultan finally disbanded the Janissaries. Quite tellingly, this was dubbed the auspicious incident. With that, the Janissaries faded from history.